So let's do the Coot tutorial. Um, starting from the beginning, uh, so we open up a terminal type Coot and I'm arranging my windows so that I can see the window from which I launched Coot um, as well as the Coot window. Obviously it's mostly overlaid but we can see some text if Coot has given us error messages or other information there. Uh, let's load a model and data, calculate load tutorial model and data. I'm using a keyboard status monitor so you can see which uh, keys I'm pressing and which buttons I'm pressing on the mouse. Left to right, uh, left mouse click and drag is uh, rotating the view. Up and down, right mouse is um, zoom and also horizontally. Middle mouse, click on an atom, brings that atom to the centre of the screen. And there we go, do it again. Click, click, uh, double click, uh, left mouse uh, uh, labels and unlabels the atom. So middle mouse uh, changes the contour level. I'm scrolling the middle mouse there. And also middle mouse uh, pan, we're not scrolling it, just click and hold and drag is, um, well, obviously panning the view, and that's just the same as Pymol, I believe. Right mouse click and drag, uh, shifts in Z, so we're pulling the, the molecule towards us, and uh, right mouse control, uh, left to right, changes the depth of field. Okay, so let's change the colour of a map. So we go to Display Manager, Properties, scroll down, until we get to the colour button, click on the colour button and we're moving the little white triangle around so we can go white, black and coloured. I like it to be uh, some combination of the above uh, with just uh, a, a little bit of uh, steel blue sort of colour. Um, uh, we're choosing a map for refinement and I press the estimate button and that gets the weight about right. Uh, so the weight of x-ray terms versus geometry terms. Right, I'm moving the mouse left to right and you can see it's rotating into the screen. Um, some people don't like that so let's use the preferences, edit preferences and then choose HID, turn it into turntable mode. We can choose it was a spherical surface which is a default but turntable mode means that it now rotates about a vertical axis which is uh, the mode that I prefer, but not the way uh, Coot is by default and not the way Pymol is either. So we're doing a bit of validation, validate density fit analysis, and we're changing the scale so that we can see the outliers and we can see that orange block over there, residue 89, click on the block and Coot navigates to that place in the map and the model. Uh, so I'm just labeling and unlabeling the atom and you can see that the uh, the model goes one way and the density goes the other. We'd like to make our model match the data or the the map. And there are a number of tools that we can use to do that. We're going to use Rotom as a refinement and then undo it and use uh, AutoFit. But let's do Rotom as first. So we click on Rotom as. Oh, let me show you that you can label the uh, icons. So you click on the button down the bottom there, you can do icons and text. So while you're learning Coot, it, this may be a useful option. So the thing we want to do here is Rotomers. So select Rotomers, then click on the residue, on Atom in the residue, and then it flips it around to the top Rotomer. Now I can click on these buttons and um, it moves the rotomer. But also, what's more convenient is to use the right hand to move the view and the left hand to change the rotomer. So I'm using dot and comma on the keyboard to move up and down that list. I find a rotomer that's suitable, I press OK. Now you can see that the orientation of the side chain doesn't quite match that of the density, so we need to tweak that. And we're going to use real space refinement to do it. So real space refine zone, click, click on an atom and it uh, straightens up uh, the, the phenol ring there. Uh, so let's undo that and try something else. And what we're going to do is use um, autofit rotomer. So autofit rotomer and then click on a residue and it just 
does it for us. And there's a little bit of tweaking we can do to uh, just minor, minor adjustment of the, of the ring there. OK, so that has fixed that problematic rotor mount. Let's do um, unmodeled blobs. So we use the default, seems reasonable. Maybe we could change that up a bit, but let 1.4 is OK. Um, we have some regions of the map that are too big to be waters, and they are as yet unexplained by an atomic model. They're sorted by size. You can see there's some peptide there. there. This is the ligand here, and this is uh, something interacting with an arginine. So you can see it's tetrahedral, and it might be something from our crystallization conditions. So we consider or consult our database and find out it was crystallized from ammonium sulfate. So let's add um, a sulfate into uh, the model. We choose the model and press the sulfate. It did a jiggle fit there. And now we are interested in the ways in which, um, the manner in which this uh, new sulfate is interacting with the protein. There are some blobs down here which are symmetry related. Let's turn on symmetry related uh, atoms and I'm going to change the color to a bit pinky. So it's, yeah, so there we go, slightly pink atoms and then I can show uh, environment distances and I can see the ways or the distances to the uh, environment atoms and you can see that there's uh, well you know that sulfate and arginine are informally charged so you've got some charge charge salt bridge interactions going on there by dentate and lovely okay so that was blob number three done okay so blob number two is our ligand this is a nucleotide binding protein rnas um, and what we want to do is fit the ligand, but first we need to fix that problem in the main chain or the whole region over there uh, in the protein. Um, so let's use a validate Ramachandran plot. Oh, we could use a Clywick plot to look at the relative distance between chains, but let's use a Clywick plot, uh, Ramachandran plot. I'm, I'm, I'm going to select just the A chain because we're only modeling the A chain at the moment. And if I click on the, or mouse over, in fact, if I mouse over the atoms or the blobs there, then I can label them. And if I click on them, Cooch recenters on it. So what we'd like to do here is uh, to remodel this. Now, I'm a bit confused by all the information going on here. So I'm just going to scroll the uh, difference map up. And I'm going to turn off the interaction analysis just so it clarifies the uh, view of what it is that's wrong and what we need to do to adjust the positions to make it right. So I say OK to that. There we go. Clarifies the position. We can see that the main chain is out of position and the side chain is uh, mostly out of position. Real spatial find zone, click and then A, and it uh, dives into the um, uh, map except for one little piece here. This carbonyl oxygen needs to flip, be flipped around. Um, it's being attached to the water, but we need to uh, flip it um, and pull it into the green blob there. So which one do we flip? Do we flip this peptide or the next one? Um, so flip this one. Oh, I picked the wrong one. Now flip this, this uh, next peptide, and then that flips in the green ball, tells us we have good probability for the Ramachandran plot for this residue. OK, so now we have sorted out the main chain or that interacting glutamic acid there. And now we can uh, work on the way in which um, the ligand is going to fit into its blob. Bring the ligand blob to the centre of the screen. Click and drag. OK, so we know that the name of the compound is uh, 3 prime guanosine monophosphate. Um, but we don't know the three-letter code for that. Well, let's imagine that we don't. And we want to search the monomer library for that compound. Does it exist? Search monomer library. OK, so I type in the parts of the name that I know. I know it's called monophosphate and guanosine. So if I put spaces between those two things, it uses those as word components to search the library. We get a list of all the matches. 
So we go down the list, we get a chemical diagram, and we can see that the one that we want is 3GP. There it is. Click on the button and it beams it in. Goodbye. OK, so now we are just checking the geometry is what we expect it to be. It's a guanosine and it's a three prime phosphate. OK, so now we want to make that ligand fit that blob. Let's undisplay it for the moment, otherwise it would just be visually uh, confusing. And we want to select that ligand for um, ligand fitting. And we don't need it to be flexible at the moment. We can choose right here because we don't need to search the whole map because we found the place where the ligand fits. We just need to get the orientation correct. And uh, we're going to do some refinement after it has found a uh, reasonable hit. There it goes. It does some refinement and drops into the density. We found a solution it says. OK, um, so we're looking at this and it does a reasonably good job, except the hydroxymethyl on the ribose there. Um, it's pointing in the wrong direction um, after refinement. So we didn't fix that. Um, we, we, it, the refinement didn't correct it, I mean. Uh, so what we're going to do is to do some refinement here and I'm going to click and drag on the hydrogen and just pull it round so that it fits into its tube. There we go. Um, the restraints make it so that it doesn't quite fit the tube very well, uh, perfectly, but it's pretty good. And it, the density is not that strong anyway. Right, you can see that these things are different colours, so what we want to now to do is to bring the ligand into the main proteins. There it is, merge 5 into 0. They're the same colours now, and now they're in the same molecule. We can look at the ways in which the ligand is interacting with its environment. So some arginines around the phosphate and some hydrogen bonds around the guanine. All right.